my name is David Hester, and this is a supplementary rule of the Alt P. Bach Club approach, number one, to interpreting primary source P. Brachs. As you remember, the five rules that we've outlined so far is get back to the primary sources, to play genres and allow tempos to be as variant as the genres um, require, and to eliminate cadences and allow Krahanen to be informed by the dominant musical structure of the song behind the score, and reintroduce the structure of the Urlar refrain to improve your interpretive ability when it comes to performing the variations on the themes that these cycles and motions represent. Those are the five rules. This is an ancillary rule, and it's not quite a rule yet because I'm not sure how I feel about it, but I know what I do myself. If you decide that you're going to play a P. Brach score from earliest witnesses, it's probably best and musically challenging and very interesting for you as a performer, good for you as a performer, to respect the Terelath and Kronloth and any other movement that you see as it's written. Learn to play them. For example, we know of D throws that are true throws. We know of D throws that are like our modern light throws, and we know of D throws that are like our modern heavy throws. They all exist. They all exist. We see movements that just were wiped out by Angus Mackay um, because he wanted to simplify. He just wanted to simplify and standardize. And he did a good job of that and wiped out a number of really interesting flourishes that um, we don't hear much of, but they exist on these scores and on these pages, and learn to play them. More interestingly is things like um, what are called the redundant A forms of Terelot and Krenloth. Um It's not a redundant A, it's a redundant G, actually. The earliest um, manuscripts that we have show that the introduction of a second G was um, a late development. Joseph um, McDonald doesn't show that in a Kronloth or a Terraloth. Um, not that they wasn't performed, because we do see it in Donald McDonald, the heavy grip. But with the heavy grip, there was always a grip to a low A. Always, no matter what, whether it was a half grip or a full grip, there was the low A before you went to an Idri or before you went to the high E. Why is that important? Well, it's not, except for this. The Terelos were written very clearly in a compound rhythmic style. And to hear them played that way is eye-opening and musically exciting. Um, Jack Lee does it um, when he plays um, What's the tune he's famous for? They play um, wonderful, beautiful, and that rhythm is something that awakens you to new possibilities um, with respect to what a Terloth could sound like and a Terloth cycle of motions could sound like and offsets often the common time rhythm of like a shul when it's played as a compound time movement. Um, so musically diverse, musically interesting, and technically challenging, very good for you as a musician. <clears throat> Krenlos, the um, redundant A Krenlos. Why would you play that? Well, because it's beefy, 
you want something to sound percussive, try that. Man, that's a big, heavy, big, impressive sounding movement when you put that low A back in. Most of you probably actually play the low A without knowing it, just embrace it. And it's just a really cool exercise to, um, again, get into your fingers. It's not going to destroy you anything else. I, I can play um, a traditional style tr tr um, teraloth and then go into my marches and play a modern style teraloth. It's not a big deal. One last thing, false gotcha. The word false gotcha in Gaelic means open. Play false gotchas open. Don't play the closed e -dry. Play them open. Why? The melody comes through. The arpeggio of an open false gotcha allows the melody to come through. And it is musically more interesting and compelling when you do it. It's less percussive and more musical. So that's kind of quasi rule six. It's hard, but it, you can do it. And as a musician, you will appreciate the challenges and the opportunities that these early styles represent for you.